Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to those of you out in the uh, technological world to the November 23rd, 2020 uh, Moscow uh, Public Works and fin Finance Committee meeting. Joining us today in person is Councillor Art Bedke. Hello, Good sir. Day. And uh, through the wonders of Zoom, Councillor Ann Zabala. Hello, Ann. Um, our items here in, I'm sorry, before we go any further, for staff, uh, Gary Reedner is joining us as well. The regular agenda first item is the approval of the November 9th, 2020 Public Works and Finance Committee meeting minutes. Good by me. Okay, they look good to me too. Ann, what do you think? Oh. Did they look okay to you, Ann, the minutes? Oh, yeah, yes. Okay. Good, thank you. Okay, Mr. Reedner, those are approved. Thank you. Our second item is an ordinance amending Moscow City Code Title Seven Chapters, mm -hmm. 147, 10, 12, 15, and 16. Are there any left? Um, regarding construction regulations, Justin Goodwin is joining us. There you are, sir, hello. Hi there, how are you guys doing today? Good. Good. So, uh, yeah, the document you have before you is the amendments to the construction regulations to, for the city of Moscow. <clears throat> um, one thing that I uh, want to make note of is the legislator passed uh, House Bill 547, which basically uh, did not allow us to amend the uh, residential portion of the code like we have in the past. Uh, and, and this was to keep it pretty much equal throughout the whole state of Idaho. So that's why you see that, that pretty much we've deleted a ton of stuff out of, out of our code. And that's the reason why. Another reason why is, is um, I found out that, you know, city of Moscow has just been ahead of the game. Um, so the codes have finally just caught up to us. So, which is kind of really interesting. Um, <clears throat> So basically we held our building code advisory committee meetings. Uh, Art, he made every single one of them. I appreciated that. Um, and we went through it and uh, really not much is changing other than getting rid of a bunch of stuff out of the, uh, out of the residential code. Um, now in the fire code, what you'll notice is we're just basically putting it in line with the um, what is already in the fire code uh, language wise and uh, talking with Dan Ellenwood, our, our division chief fire marshal, um, he did a presentation for us about addressing. Um, you know, we're getting to a point where we're, we're building a lot of uh, homes behind homes or ADUs and things like that. And addressing has been, been kind of a little bit of a nightmare trying to trying to locate those places. So. Uh, put our heads together and uh, in that part we came up with what the committee thought was uh, was a good idea is, is actually having those addresses out on the front because the code just says you have to have them on the building. Um, uh, other than that really like I said earlier we just took a bunch of stuff out of the code so we actually made title 7 a little bit smaller which is which is kind of nice. Ann or Art, any questions? No questions, but a couple of comments. As Justin was right, uh, Moscow had good code working with our amendments, and the rest of the code finally caught up with us, and so we didn't need to have them in anymore. And also, the construction architect community of Moscow should be commended for showing up and doing the hard, heavy lifting and discussing as they marched their way through all this code. So kudos and thumbs up to the guys who participated and hashed through all of this stuff throughout the course of our meetings. So from my point of view, they looked sensible, reasonable, and well thought out and puts us into compliance with the state and international codes. Excellent. Ann, is, is that exactly what you were thinking and Art just got to it first? Precisely. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> really, if you had some thoughts, you're welcome to. I was just being funny. Um, I think we should probably recommend forwarding the proposed ordinance for public hearing at the council's December 7th meeting. How's that grab you? A day that will live in infamy. We'll put it on. 
Justin, nice work. Thank you, sir. Excellent. Thank you very much. Okay, our third item is the University of Idaho Emergency Services Renewal uh, Action Agreement Renewal. So, University of Idaho Emergency Services Agreement Renewal. Mr. Reedner. Thank you. What you have before you today <coughs> is the draft uh, master agreement for services. The city has been providing services to the University of Idaho for uh, emergency services, typically police, dispatch, fire, EMS response, uh, since 1966 pursuant to contract. We've provided it for years before that, but it was in 66 when, uh, when we finally reduced it to a contract and um, the university and the city have been under contract ever since. In 2010, the university, or late 2009, uh, the university actually put it out for a request for, for qualifications and proposals uh, to determine whether or not there were other law enforcement entities that wanted to provide that service to the U of I. <clears throat> At that time, the city was the only entity to respond. Uh, Latah County Sheriff at the time decided that that was not something that he felt his department could do, which was a natural, you know, they, they um, the sheriff's office, uh, more rural, dealing with um, uh, the more rural aspects of law enforcement. Uh, so they decided they did not want to respond. The only other uh, entity that could respond you then know, has arrest powers in the bad. state of Idaho uh, is the uh, Idaho State Police. And they didn't respond, of course, because that's uh, not what they do either. So we responded, we negotiated an agreement uh, for an initial um, three-year period, renewed for an additional three-year period. Then it was renewed in 2016, I believe, for another three-year period. We are at the end of that three-year period. That was 2017, excuse me. Uh, as of October 1st of 2020, uh, the current agreement expires under its renewal term and kicks over to a year-to-year -year agreement after that. We were approached by the University of Idaho. Uh, we've been talking about uh, negotiating a renewal for some time. Uh, the University of Idaho, as you know, was going through some serious financial uh, constraints. So they approached the city and asked whether the city would be willing to uh, reduce or eliminate the inflationary adjustment every year. Uh, we negotiated that, and as you see in this agreement, uh, for the first year, which is the year that we're currently in, beginning October 1st, 2020, uh, through September 30th, 2021, uh, the amount of the agreement would stay the same as it was in the previous fiscal year. Uh, then from 2021 to 2022, uh, there would be a 1% inflationary increase in 2022 to 2023, 2%, and then it would go to the regular 3% adjustment every year thereafter. Um, the term that we negotiated was an initial term of five years and then a renewal for an additional five years give both the city of Moscow and the University of Idaho some predictability, which is what we're trying to do in all of our contracts at this point. Uh, the, uh, so that covers the compensation and the term. The only other issue, and as I mentioned in my um, CCSR, uh, the only other issue that we're dealing with at this point is um, the University of Idaho has agreed throughout the years that when we need to purchase a ladder truck, then the university pays for half of that. The current ladder <coughs> truck uh, was purchased in 2000. The university paid for half of that, and we've continued that into this agreement. Uh, there are some questions about how that's going to happen. Uh, it's due to be replaced in 2025. Uh, the university just had some questions, wanted to see our schedule for doing that and talk about some of those things. And uh, some questions about, okay, when the ladder truck is salvaged, when it's traded in or whatever happens to it, where does that money go? We'll work through that. Uh, suffice it to say that I've had discussions with Brian Foise, uh, the, uh, the uh, 
Vice President for Finance at the University, and this will be going to the State Board of Education uh, Regents of the U of I uh, at their December meeting. We can work out whatever particulars, if there's anything that needs to be adjusted uh, regarding the ladder truck. So with that, uh, what I'm requesting is that the uh, committee recommend uh, approval of the agreement. Uh, we should have, if there is any adjustment regarding the ladder truck, we should have that prior to the December meeting, December 7th, when this will be uh, brought to City Council. But uh, very pleased with it. It is provides stability, which is something that uh, we've been wanting to do in all of our operations. With that, I'd answer any questions. And let's start with you this time. Did you have any questions at no, all? Just my comment would be that I think um, it makes sense and in terms of a service that we can provide in a partnership to establish with that scale of economy for us. And I like seeing the increases built in over the next couple of years too. So no questions. I think it looks good and it makes sense to me to recommend approval for the full council. Okay. Arthur, how about you? Uh, ditto that and the five year with one five year renewal certainly adds to the stability and predictability. And I'm very much in favor of that and the contract as a whole. Um, Gary, I just uh, I have zero complaints or, or concerns about this, except for the, um, and I appreciate you working on this, the ladder truck, it's not in peril of being 50% um, funded. It's just figuring out how it all is going to happen. Yeah, correct? mostly mostly technical okay. questions. Uh, the university has indicated they don't have an issue with with funding half of it. It's just a question of how does that, how do the machinations of that happen? Excellent. Good. Well, they, they are awesome partners, and I, I, they're going to continue to be. So, Okay, well, I hear us all saying let's recommend approval of the Master <laughs> Services Agreement with the University of Idaho at the December meeting. Thank you. You're welcome, sir. Yes. Thank you. Um, this is our last item um, of our regular agenda. We do have a report from Mar Mike Ray on the Paradise Creek Flood Hazard Study. Good afternoon, counselors. Hello, Mike. How are you? Doing well, thank you. I'm just gonna share my screen. <clears throat> Everybody see that? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Excellent. So I just wanted to provide the council with an update to a, uh, a, a project that uh, started this last month. It's the Paradise Creek Flood Hazard Mitigation Study. And just to provide a, a brief background, uh, during spring of 2017, there were some flooding events that occurred in the city, uh, which FEMA encouraged us to apply for a flood hazard mitigation grant. Uh, it was really intended to study and identify and construct uh, potential flood hazard mitigation actions uh, to reduce some of that property damage that we saw during those events. And earlier this year, the city was awarded about 295000 in grant funding, and that was under FEMA's Advanced Assistant Program. So they kind of diverted us to this uh, alternate program to provide some funding. Uh, and the total project cost was 342000 And Aspect Consulting of Yakima was selected as the consultant uh, for the project, and that occurred uh, just this last September. Uh, so the study will explore potential flood hazard mitigation alternatives and determine the most viable method to resolve flooding issues. Uh, just looking at the study reach, uh, it's up by Darby Road on the northern boundary and then by Troy Highway, kind of that white <coughs> Steiner intersection. Uh, that whole reach of Paradise Creek will be studied as part of this project. Uh, will include uh, current conditions, assessment of hydrologic conditions, as well as developing a hydraulic model uh, for modeling of the, uh, the floodplain in that area. Uh, alternatives will be developed and assessed to mitigate flooding within the impacted area, and uh, we've anticipated about 14 months uh, is what that will take to complete uh, this project. So. Uh, just a, a, map, a quick map here of the, uh, the areas that we'll be taking a look at. So this is uh, obviously Paradise Creek. You can see the properties in uh, blue on your screen there. So right near the, uh, you can see the, the Highway 8, so Troy Highway and that white Steiner intersection uh, to the south. And then all the way up past Mountain View Park, uh, up North Mountain View to Darby Road. 
uh, where Paradise Creek crosses Darby. Uh, the study will uh, extend to that area. So it'll be this whole corridor. And this is the area of town where Paradise Creek is and the 100 year floodplain where we see the, the most amount of flooding and, and the most issues. Uh, so we formed a technical advisory committee uh, as part of the process and there are a number of stakeholders that are involved. Uh, Shane Slate with the Army Corps of Engineers uh, provides representation as well as Mike Nealon uh, who's local with Latah County Disaster Services. Uh, we have Doug Jones with Idaho Department of Water Resources out of the Coeur d'Alene office. Uh, Nick Davids with PCEI. Uh, we just included Blues Clearwater Environmental Institute just because of uh, partnerships in the past with uh, kind of that riparian area of floodplain um, regentrification. Uh, Ryan Bender's Idaho Office of Emergency Management is also included. Uh, and through the city folks, uh, there's a few people in our department. Uh, Bill, myself, and Scott Bondrager, our city engineer, are involved. And then over on the public works side, uh, Steve Schulte, obviously being the streets manager and responding to a lot of those flooding events, uh, has intimate knowledge uh, with a lot of the issues that we have in the system as well as Kyle Steele, our environmental uh, coordinator, uh, is involved as well. He works hand in hand with IDWR uh, and DEQ and some of the other entities that we may have to go through uh, with permitting. So that'll be helpful to have him on there, as well as David Schott with the Parks and Rec uh, Department. And so a lot of uh, Paradise Creek flows through some of our parkland properties, and it's likely that some of the mitigation approaches may involve manipulation to some of those properties uh, for maybe water store, you know, floodplain storage and things like that, channel modifications. And so I uh, wanted to have the Parks and Rec Department represented on the committee. And uh, Art has graciously agreed to be on the committee as well as the council rep. And we did have our first uh, technical advisory committee meeting and that occurred actually last week. And uh, really the first, this kind of lays out the three TAC meetings that we have planned uh, and, the, and the dates, the tentative dates there. So last week we had the first uh, meeting. That was really just an introductory meeting. Um, review the mission, the work plan, uh, cover the study background, really to familiarize the, the members who are unfamiliar with the project uh, and to provide a little bit of background as well as to solicit some input. Uh, primarily from Steve on those problem locations that we've had in the past. Uh, and then looking towards the future, uh, we anticipate the next TAC meeting is gonna be March of next year. And that's really after our consultants had a chance to uh, gather all the data and do some modeling, uh, look at those kind of high priority problem areas and the mitigation <coughs> approaches that could uh, be undertaken <coughs> to alleviate some of those. Uh, we'll do that at that meeting as well as looking at some alternative, you know, preliminary alternatives for discussion and then uh, city approved alternative evaluation criteria. And then looking on to the third and final TAC meeting, uh, that would be in next, you know, next fall, so August 2021, uh, reviewing the preliminary alternative evaluation results, recommended preferred mitigation alternative, and uh, the modeling results and potential mapping changes that could occur uh, as part of this study. And then it's planned that we will conduct uh, two open houses. And so these were originally uh, intended to be in-person open houses, but we've made a shift to more of a virtual format just because of the ongoing uh, COVID situation. And so the first uh, open house is anticipated to be this next month in December. Uh, really just inviting the, the community and the public and other stakeholders in uh, to take a look at the study area, talk about the project, and uh, really just a, an introductory uh, meeting and provide some background information about kind of what the goals and objectives are, as well as any other input that uh, the public or other stakeholders may have uh, with known problems uh, that they're aware of. And then we'll look towards a second open house in October of 2021, uh, just to review alternatives, uh, the results of the alternative evaluation process, prevent, uh, present the preferred uh, mitigation alternative, review modeling results and potential mapping changes uh, during that open house meeting, really just to share uh, kind of what the consultants found uh, during the course of the study at that point. 
So just to give you an update on our current status, so Aspect's currently in the process of gathering that existing data. So they've been uh, collecting a lot of this background data, so soils, types, topography. We have some existing LIDAR data, I think from 2017, uh, that they've acquired, taking a look at our flood insurance rate map and our flood insurance study for the city. Uh, looking at historic flood photos, records, and damage information. So every major flooding event we've had, the 96, 97 flood, and most recently uh, within this last year, taking a look at some of those photos uh, of the problem areas has been really helpful uh, to them as well. So they've been collecting that information. And then uh, part of this is gonna be reviewing and inspecting existing stormwater detention facilities. And so, you know, a lot of these facilities have been built over the years uh, and are constructed in accordance with uh, our, our standards at the time. And a lot of them uh, are constructed as part of subdivision and development. And uh, so they'll be taking a look at, you know, the orifice, orifices in, in those facilities and the current shape of a lot of the facilities just to make sure that nothing's changed over time and they're operating as they were originally intended to and there's not gonna be any issues there. So. Uh, those are some of the things that, you know, they'll be taking a look at. Doesn't necessarily need to change, but we need to make sure that they're, those are operating as they should. Uh, and then the kind of the larger one right now is that's ongoing is the ground survey data. So um, they've contracted with JUB Engineers, which is a, a local firm, uh, to do some engineering and site survey. Uh, we're gonna need to access about 148 properties that exist uh, within that study reach uh, to do some on-ground surveying. Uh, we sent those letters out for the right of entry uh, permission. We did that about a few weeks ago. Uh, it's actually, we've we received uh, some good results with that. So approximately 110 uh, right of entry forms have been received. So we only have about 30, 40 uh, left to receive. So we'll be reaching back out to the folks that we haven't heard from to see if we can uh, finalize that process to get our survey crews for JUB uh, in early December out there to, to do some elevations. And so that's what this map's uh, intended to represent, not only show the, the study area, but uh, all these uh, properties in blue are the, the properties that they'll be um, going on to and doing a lot of the survey work to get that elevation data. You know, it's, it's hard without current LIDAR data to go out there with all the tree canopies to get uh, accurate floodplain, flood channel uh, information. So they'll be going out and, uh, and doing that on site. So taking a look at the future, what the next steps are. So there'll be a hydrologic analysis that uh, the Aspect Consulting will undertake as soon as they get a lot of this preliminary data. And then a flooding analysis and characteristics, uh, conceptual flood hazard mitigation alternatives uh, once they begin to study the uh, the floodplain and the uh, flooding areas, an alternative analysis and evaluation, and then we'll go into preferred alternatives and the preliminary design uh, of those preferred alternatives. And it's anticipated that uh, you know, like I mentioned before, it's a 14-month project, so the anticipation is that it uh, everything would be wrapped up in March of 2022. And so that's, that's essentially the presentation. I just wanted to update the council on, on that project and, and wanted to keep you abreast of what was going on and, and answer any questions that uh, you may have. Yeah, and our art, got any questions? Sir, you're kind of in the middle of it, you wanna? Yeah, no questions necessarily, but uh, just a comment that this really is a big, big project and trying to mitigate flooding events is also going to be a big, big project. And so part of the whole study here is to articulate some reasonable mitigation efforts that can be gotten into. But beyond that, also providing us with cost benefit analysis so we can get the biggest bang for the buck early on and provide a sequence of mitigation events that make sense to go into the future to take care of the problem both now and going forward, and meshing this with our stormwater utility as well. So it's, it's a big, complicated project, but it seems to be off to a good start with uh, the various stakeholder input and the uh, consulting firm that's doing it. So, so far, so good. Excellent. And do you have any questions or any comments? 
Yeah, um, I really appreciated the update. My tech may have cut out for a minute. Um, what is LIDAR data, if I'm pronouncing that correctly? It's more or less just elevation data. So it's like topography, only it's 3D instead of 2D. So it's a laser-based system where you fly a plane over and bounce laser beams off the terrain underneath of you, and it creates essentially a 3D topo map for you. So if you're mapping a stream bed, it makes it very easy to see where uh, impediments are, where silt is accumulated, uh, things like that. Can you all hear me okay? Now we can, sure. <laughs> <laughs> my question and I apologize if you answered this already what is LIDAR data if I'm pronouncing that correctly you must have cut out Anne um, it, essentially laser Shoot. focus it ends up being topography and gives a 3D model of the terrain so um, I think Art said it best but instead of you know more of a T 2D topography it'll end up giving a 3D image uh, and we'll be able to tell what the actual stream channel itself is, had, how that's changed over time. You know, a lot of this is affected by upstream silt with farmland. And so, um, you know, over time, the stream bed ends up uh, getting filled in uh, with a lot of this silt. And so we don't know how that's affected, been affected over time. So we need to get an accurate uh, representation of what the 3D image of, of the stream bed looks like, as well as the, cha you know, the channel and the banks uh, themselves. So that, that's what LIDAR is. Thank you for the explanation twice, it sounds like. Sure. Um, and then I did have another question. Um, I think it's great that we're doing an open house. I imagine that the expectation, um, it'd be great if we get some folks there, but will there be any opportunity for online engagement around this as well? Yeah, we're creating a project website. And so I, I think I mentioned early on that we were in, originally intended to have an in-person open house, but this has moved all virtual. So um, we'll have a project website Ooh, that'll gotcha. be linked on, on our city website. And then our consultant is uh, gonna be doing all of that. So I, I think they have some type of uh, software that, that does virtual meetings, virtual open houses. And so we'll up, be updating the, the project website as well as providing some type of interactive um, informational you know, display to be able to get some uh, input from stakeholders and, and the public uh, through, through online virtual format, so. Perfect, yeah, those are all my questions. Thank you so much. And I was really lovely to hear um, more information about the, the TAC and the timeline. That was all really helpful. So Thank you. Thank you, Ann. Um, Mike, earlier, maybe it was the end of last year or early this year, some um, flood plains were remapped here in the city and we were looking at um, specifically down on what, 95 there? Yeah. Um, is this that kind of work or is there the potential to use the data that we're gathering to maybe someday remap some of those flood plains or, or am, I, am I kind of two separate is my understanding not as good as it should be? Well, that could be the end result. Um, you know, in those areas, there, was, there wasn't necessarily anything that was done that changed the floodplain. It was just restudied. Right. And so that was from the south couplet to essentially the, our southern boundary of this project. So that white <clears throat> Steiner Avenue, eight, you know, Highway 8 intersection. And so what occurred there was, uh, you know, we had looked back at some historical data on our flood insurance rate map and flood insurance study and saw there was an old railroad bridge that was included as part of that study. And so, um, you know, identifying that, and then we, I think we consulted with Terra Graphics, Alta, uh, at the time in order to redo the analysis, submit that to FEMA, and do a, a conditional letter of map revision, which essentially uh, remaps that study reach there. And so that was just to remove the bridge from the calculations. And what that did was essentially eliminated a lot of the 100 year floodplain from that area because we've never right. really seen a whole lot of flooding in, you know, on, on that area. And it'll be important for the stub seed property as that redevelops as well. Right. Originally, that was shown to be in the 100 year floodplain. 
as well as a number of residential properties. So like the Washington Trust Bank that was just recently sure. constructed was originally in the 100 year floodplain. And so what that did was eliminate the, the 100 year floodplain from a lot of those properties, mm -hmm. really just contained it to the channel itself. And so, you know, that would eliminate the need for flood insurance for all those properties, as well as, uh, you know, as those gentrify in that area, the rehabilitation of a lot of those properties will be you know, a lot less affected by the uh, floodplain requirements. And right. so that's important to that area. Um, this project, uh, you know, I think the end goal, depending upon what the mitigation approaches end up being, uh, will ultimately be some type of letter of map revision to amend the floodplain in that area. But we'll just have to see, you know, that we're gonna, right now it's just gonna be a study. They're gonna do the cost benefit analysis after they identify some mitigation approaches. And so maybe it's uh, doing some, some culverts, you know, shifting water from one location to the other. Maybe it's large storage on some of our parkland property. Uh, maybe it's replacing some bridges that are currently honeycomb, you know, designs uh, and do a free span structure. You know, a lot of, there's gonna be a lot of things uh, that, can, that we're going to take a look at and it's just going to be that cost benefit analysis what you know what's the most bang for the, the least amount of money that we're going to be able to get and then maybe in the future this we'll be able to roll this into another grant funding opportunity in order to actually implement a lot of the mitigation approaches that they're going to recommend and then after they do that um, and we maybe we get those constructed and implemented, we'll be able to, to submit this to FEMA and get actually get the, the floodplain amended and, and remapped in that area. So I think that's the end goal with, with that. Okay, good. Well, I'm glad it wasn't as far off as I, as I thought it was, so <laughs> good. Okay, well, excellent. I appreciate your report. Any, anything else from our, my cohorts? Okay, well, um, Thank you all for your attendance today. Um, I wish you all a, a happy Thanksgiving. Enjoy the time and have a good holiday. Thank you very much.